Born into a world where my last name opened more doors than I wanted, you could say I had it all set up for me. My dad's the big boss of a company you've probably seen on the stock exchange screen more times than you've cursed your morning alarm. Yes, that kind of rich. But if you're expecting stories of a golden girl draped in designer clothes and sipping champagne for breakfast, you've got the wrong story. Me, I've always kept it real, with my feet firmly on the ground. Money is nice, sure, but it's not everything. I chose a different path, one that led me to places money can't buy and experiences no gold card can fetch. Charity work, helping those in need, and living a life that's, well, ordinary that's me, Laura. Not the fancy Laura, just Laura. So there I was, stuck in one of those typical evenings where my friend Amy decided we all needed to get out more. We ended up at this dive downtown, the kind where the beer is cheap and the lights are dim enough to hide your regrets. Amy was all hyped up, going on about some guy she met online. You've got to meet him, Jess. He's totally your type, she kept saying. My type? Since when did she decide she knew my type? Anyway, we're there, and in walks this guy, not Amy's online prince, but another dude, Eric. He was there with some friends, looking as out of place as a cat at a dog show. He wasn't dressed to impress, just a simple t-shirt, jeans, and this easy smile that lit up the room. We got to talking, and it was easy, like really easy. He worked a manager job at a place I'd never heard of, nothing fancy, but he talked about it with this passion that was kind of infectious. You really dig your job, huh? I remember asking, sipping on my third beer. Absolutely. Eric shot back, leaning in. Every day is a challenge, but hey, I'm not here to bore you with work talk. What about you? Amy mentioned charity work. I shrugged, trying to downplay it. Yes, a bit of this and that, just trying to do my part, you know. That's cool, really cool, he said, and I could tell he meant it, not in a trying to impress you way, but genuinely. The night went on with our group mingling, but Eric and I stuck together, chatting about everything and nothing. It was refreshing talking to someone who wasn't trying to sell me on some investment or brag about their latest acquisition. As the night was winding down, Eric got this look in his eye like he was working up to something. Hey, Laura, I know this is kind of forward, but would you want to grab dinner with me sometime, just us? I remember feeling a mix of surprise and excitement. Sure, I said, trying to sound cool about it. I'd like that. On the way home, Amy was all giggles and I told you so. I just smiled, thinking about the evening. Eric was a breath of fresh air in my often too stale world. Little did I know how much things were about to change. It wasn't long before going out turned into hanging out at each other's places, which mostly meant my cozy apartment because Eric's roommates were a circus and a half. One evening, sprawled on the couch after devouring what might be the world's most average take of pizza, Eric turned to me, his eyes serious, but his tone light. Laura, how do you feel about making this a more permanent arrangement? He asked, crumbs still clinging to the corner of his mouth. I raised an eyebrow. You proposing we split a Netflix account or something more along the lines of a life together? He chuckled, brushing off the crumbs. Well, I was thinking more like a life together, but hey, we can start with Netflix. The simplicity of it, the straightforwardness, no grand gestures or dramatic backdrops, just us in our element. It felt right? Eric, if you're asking what I think you're asking, yes, a thousand times yes. And just like that, with the aroma of cheap pizza as our witness, we decided to tie the knot. It was swift, sure, but when you know, you know. Telling our families was the next hurdle. My folks, well, they've always been about the as long as you're happy mantra, but this was putting it to the test. Dad with his business empire and mom the socialite, they had visions of me settling down with someone more in our circle. I broke the news over dinner, the fancy kind where you're not sure which fork to use for the salad. Mom, Dad, I'm getting married to Eric. I said the words quickly, almost tumbling out. Dad paused, his fork midair. Eric, the manager guy? Well, 
that's quick. Mom simply smiled, but it was a bit tight. Dear, are you sure? This is rather sudden, isn't it? But I was firm. Yes, I'm sure. He's amazing, and we're really happy together. Their skepticism was clear, but so was their love. Well, if he makes you happy, darling. Mom conceded, and Dad nodded in agreement. Eric's parents were a whole different story. We went over to their place, a cozy little house that always seemed to smell like fresh cookies or something equally comforting. Kelly and Jason were as down-to-earth as they come, and they welcomed me like I had always been part of the family. Eric tells us you're setting a date. Jason asked, passing me a plate of those famous cookies. Yes, we're thinking sooner rather than later. A small ceremony, nothing fancy, I replied trying to gauge their reaction. Oh, sweetheart, that's wonderful. We're just thrilled for you both. Kelly beamed. Their warmth was enveloping, a stark contrast to the cautious optimism of my own parents. It was clear right from the start that our worlds were different, but the common ground was the genuine happiness for me and Eric. When planning the wedding, we were on the same page. Keep it simple, keep it us. A small ceremony, close friends and family, and an open bar because, as Eric put it, if we're doing this, we're making sure everyone's having a good time. And that's how it went down. A swift engagement, not because we were rushing, but because everything just clicked into place. Amid the whirlwind, there were quiet moments, looks shared between us that said, we're doing the right thing. And we were. We really were. Living with Eric started off as everything I'd hoped for and more. We were like two peas in a pod, making our little corner of the world in that cozy, modern apartment I had rented. It was ours, filled with love, laughter, and a ton of take containers because, let's face it, neither of us were winning any awards in the kitchen. It wasn't long before I started noticing how Eric's parents, Kelly and Jason, had this way of dropping hints about things they liked or needed whenever they came over. At first, it was subtle, almost cute. Oh, Laura, that's a lovely coffee maker. Must make mornings a breeze. Kelly would say, eyeing our shiny new appliance with a gleam in her eye. Or Jason would remark, this sofa is just divine. Our old one's been giving me a right pain in the back, you know. Wanting to be the good daughter-in-law, I took note of these little hints. I'd surprise them with gifts here and their coffee maker for Kelly, a comfortable new sofa for their living room, and so on. Their initial reactions were always the same, a mix of surprise and a little bit of guilt. Oh, Laura, you shouldn't have. This is too much, Kelly would exclaim, her hands fluttering to her chest. But you know, humans are funny creatures. Give them an inch and they'll take a mile. Those initial protests faded away, replaced by a growing list of subtle hints that were about as subtle as a brick through a window. Dinner at your folks' place was lovely, dear. Did you see that new TV they have? Crystal clear. Ours is practically ancient. Eric would relay his parents' latest comments, oblivious to the change in their tone. One evening, after I had just dropped a not-so-small fortune on a fancy new TV for them, Eric and I were curled up on the couch my head resting in his lap. They really love the TV, babe. You're amazing, he said, his fingers running through my hair. But I felt the weight of their expectations starting to press down on me. Eric, do they expect us to keep doing this? It's getting a bit much, don't you think? I asked. He paused, his hand stopping mid-stroke. What do you mean? They're just happy, that's all, he replied. Happy or taking advantage? I pushed back, sitting up to look at him. It feels like we're their personal shopping service. Eric was taken aback, his brow furrowing. They're not like that, Jess. They're just not used to nice things, that's all. But where does it end, Eric? It's like they've got a taste for it now, and they're not looking back, I argued, frustration creeping into my voice. The conversation ended with an uneasy truce, but it was clear we were on different pages. Kelly and Jason's gratitude had morphed into entitlement and it was putting a strain on us on me. I loved Eric, but I wasn't about to become a bottomless ATM for his parents. 
When my dad's company hit hard times, it felt like the rug was yanked out from under my feet. That cushy life, poof, gone. And with it, the whole dynamic of my relationship took a nosedive. The shift wasn't gradual. It was like flipping a switch from daylight to darkness. I had to break the news to Eric and his folks. And let me tell you, that was a conversation I'd been dreading. Listen, things are going to get tight. Dad's company's tanking and, well, we're in for a rough ride, I told them. I tried to keep my voice steady, but the tremor betrayed my nerves. Eric's reaction was a gut punch. You're kidding me, right? What do you mean things are going to get tight? You're telling me we can't live like we used to because of your dad's mess. His words were cold, and for a second, I wish the floor would swallow me whole. Kelly and Jason's faces were no better, their disappointment barely hidden. This is quite the situation you've put us in, Laura, Jason added, his tone full of reproach. Just like that, the warmth and camaraderie we once shared disappeared, replaced by a cold expectation that somehow I was to blame for my family's financial downturn. Moving in with them was supposed to be a temporary solution. Our once independent life was swapped for a guest room that felt more like a cell in the house of two people who now saw us as a nuisance. The atmosphere was charged with tension, every day a reminder that I'd somehow failed them. We're cutting back on everything because of this, Kelly would remind me, her voice sharp as she served dinner, that was a far cry from the lavish meals we used to enjoy. And Jason always had a comment on saving costs. Make sure those lights are off. We're not running a charity here. But Eric was the hardest to bear. The man I married seemed to have vanished, replaced by someone who saw me as a letdown. Can't you do something? Talk to your dad? It's like you don't even care we're living like this. He'd snap, anger flaring over the smallest things. Our conversations, once easy and filled with future plans, were now minefields. Every word I said was a potential trigger for another outburst. I thought marrying you meant security, not this struggle. He'd throw at me during arguments, his words slicing through me. It was clear we weren't just dealing with financial stress. This was a test of our relationship, revealing true colors under pressure. I was stuck in the middle, battling the disillusionment from my husband and his parents while grappling with my own sense of failure. Callie's birthday dinner was supposed to be a cozy family thing in an upscale restaurant, a break from the constant tension, but it turned into the showdown of a lifetime. I should have seen it coming with the way things had been going at their place. We're all sitting there, menu in hand, and I'm trying to keep the peace, just blended to the background. That plan got ruined the second orders started flying. Eric, with a grin that made my skin crawl, goes, let's get the steak and lobster for us, and then throws a look my way, one part smug, two parts cruel. Laura can do with the soup of the day. Got to save where we can, right? They all laugh like it's the best joke they've heard in ages. Kelly adds her two cents. Absolutely, can't have Laura overspending now, can we? I felt a flush of heat, not from embarrassment, but pure fury. Really? Soup? What's this, some kind of sick joke? I snapped back, my voice sharper than I intended. Oh, come on, Laura, it's just a bit of fun, Eric said, that smirk still plastered on his face. That's why I lost it. Fun? This is your idea of fun. When things are tough, you show how petty you really are? I can't believe I fell for your act, I exclaimed. You could hear a pin drop. The whole restaurant was watching now the awkwardness off the charts. I didn't sit back down. Keep your fancy dishes and your pathetic jokes. I'm out, I said, standing up so fast my chair nearly toppled over, the noise echoing and turning more heads our way. Eric reached out, trying to play the peacemaker. Laura, don't. Let's not make this a scene. A scene? You think I care about making a scene after that stunt? This is about respect. Something you clearly have none of, I said, yanking my arm free and heading for the exit. The weight of their stairs was on my back, but stepping out into the night felt like breaking out of prison. My phone was blowing up, Eric no doubt trying to do damage control. I ignored it, my mind made up.
I drove back to their place, a storm of emotions brewing inside. How had things gone so sour? Eric and I were a team, or so I thought, but that dinner was a slap in the face, a wake-up call I couldn't ignore. Back at the house, I packed my bags in record time, each folded shirt a reminder of the life I was leaving behind. It wasn't just about leaving a place, it was about leaving a relationship that had shown its true colors. I turned off my phone, cutting off the barrage of messages. The silence was eerie but welcome. That night wasn't just the end of a disastrous dinner, it was the close of a chapter. I had no interest in revisiting after the disaster that was Kelly's birthday dinner. I found myself driving to my parents' house. The night was quiet, a stark contrast to the storm raging inside me. By the time I pulled up to their driveway, my decision was made. I needed sanctuary, but more than that, I needed advice something only my dad could offer. Walking into the house, the familiarity of it all was both comforting and jarring. Mom was asleep, but Dad was up, sitting in his study surrounded by papers that seemed less important the moment I stepped in. Laura, what are you doing here at this hour? Is everything okay? He asked, standing up, concern etched on his face. I took a deep breath, and the events of the evening poured out of me in a flood. I told him about the dinner, about Eric and his parents, and how I felt like I'd been reduced to nothing but a source of income for them. Dad listened in silence, his expression hardening with every word. When I finished, he sighed, a sound that carried years of experience and a hint of sorrow. Laura, I saw this coming. I just hoped I was wrong, he finally said, his voice steady but filled with empathy. How could I have been so blind to Dad? I thought Eric and I were different, I said, feeling the weight of my naivety. He walked over, putting an arm around my shoulders. You wanted to see the best in him and them. There's no fault in that. But people show their true colors in tough times. It's a hard lesson, but an important one. I nodded, the reality of his words sinking in. But what do I do now? I can't go back there. You'll stay here for starters. As for the rest, we'll figure it out together. He assured me, his confidence a balm to my frayed nerves. Then he shared something that took me by surprise. You know, the company situation isn't as dire as it seems. We're actually on the verge of a breakthrough. It was a strategic move, a way to weed out the opportunists. I stared at him, stunned. So you mean to say we're not broke? He chuckled, a sound that was part relief, part amusement. Far from it, but it was important to see who would stick around when the chips were down. Unfortunately, Eric and his family showed their true selves. The revelation was a lot to process. My anger towards Eric and his parents was now mixed with a sense of vindication. They had revealed their true motives and, in doing so, had freed me from a future of manipulation and deceit. Dad, I don't know whether to be relieved or furious, I admitted. Probably a bit of both, he said, giving me a reassuring squeeze. But the important thing is you're free to make a better future for yourself. I admit it. The emotions battling inside me were both. It's okay, but remember this experience has taught you something invaluable about people and their intentions. Use it, learn from it, he advised, grounding me. Walking up to Kelly and Jason's house the next day felt like heading into the lion's den. I was ready for a showdown, but nothing could have prepared me for the cold reception I got. Eric was standing there, divorce papers in hand with a look that could only be described as triumphant disdain. Here you go, let's get this over with, he said, practically shoving the papers at me. His parents were hovering behind, barely containing their glee. Finally getting rid of the freeloader, Kelly snickered and Jason nodded in agreement, a smug smile plastered across his face. Eric joined in, yes, turns out you're just an ordinary dummy without your daddy's money. Thought you'd cry, but guess what? We don't need a tearful mess around here. Their words stung, but not in the way they expected. I felt a bizarre mix of anger and liberation. I looked at the papers, then at them, and without a word, signed where I needed to. As I did, their smiles widened, thinking they'd won. But I had the last laugh. 
Pulling out a newspaper from my bag, I slapped it down on the table with more force than necessary. Thought you might find this interesting, I said, my voice tripping with unrestrained satisfaction. The headlines screamed about my dad's company making a monumental comeback, profits soaring higher than ever. Watching their faces drain of color was a sight I'd pay to see again. Kelly and Jason's smugness vanished, replaced by shock, then desperation. Eric's arrogance crumbled, leaving him looking like a child who just lost his favorite toy. Kelly suddenly switched gears, stepping towards me with arms wide open. Oh my sweet girl, it's all a big misunderstanding. Let's hug it out. Jason, ever the opportunist, chimed in. Let's not rush things. Sit down, have a coffee, and we can talk this through. And Eric, oh Eric, he was the picture of regret. I was wrong, okay. We can fix this. I want to make everything right, please. Their sudden change of heart was almost comical. Almost. I couldn't help but laugh, a deep hearty sound that felt cleansing. You three are something else, you know that. But here's a news flash for you. I'm done. Done with the lies, the manipulation, and the so-called family that only values me for my bank account. I turned to leave, their protests and pleas fading into the background. They called after me, a mix of desperation and disbelief in their voices. But I didn't look back. Not this time. After the spectacle at Kelly and Jason's house, I was done not just with them, but with the whole sorry saga that had become my life. I needed a fresh start, a clean slate. So I took some time at my parents' place, getting my head and heart back in the game. One afternoon, a couple of weeks after the divorce was finalized, I was out for coffee with Amy, my ever-supportive friend who had been there through it all. Girl, you look like a weight's been lifted, she commented, sipping her latte. I laughed, feeling lighter than I had in months. You have no idea. It's like I can finally breathe again, I said. Amy leaned in, her expression turning serious. So what's next for you, Jess? You have a clean slate now. I thought about it, stirring my coffee absentmindedly. I'm not sure, but I'm excited to find out. Maybe I'll travel, pick up some of the charity work I had to put on hold. As for love, I paused, giving her a rueful smile. I think I'll give that a miss for a while. Just make sure you're doing what makes you happy, okay? You deserve it after all that drama, she said, reaching over to squeeze my hand. Thanks, Amy. That's the plan. Not long after that conversation, my phone started buzzing with calls and messages from Eric. He was pleading, saying he had changed, that we could start over. His parents even got in on the act, sending messages filled with apologies and invitations to talk things over. Sitting in my room, phone in hand, I couldn't help but laugh. The sheer audacity was almost admirable. Almost. I typed out a response, one I'd been mulling over for days. Eric, moving on means moving forward, not going back to what broke you. I wish you all the best, but this is where our path ends for good. Take care. Hitting send felt like closing the final chapter of a book I'd been stuck in for too long, and just like that, I was ready to start writing a new one. The next few months were a blur of activity. I threw myself into my work, took up volunteering with a vengeance, and even booked a solo trip to a place I'd always wanted to visit. Life was full, and for the first time in a long while, it was fulfilling too. One evening, sitting on a balcony overlooking a bustling street in a far-off city, I felt a sense of peace and excitement for the future. I was ready for whatever came next. I realized I'd found what I'd been searching for all along. Peace. The drama, the heartache, the betrayal, it all seemed like a distant memory. My phone buzzed with a new message, but this time it was from a number I didn't recognize. Hesitantly, I opened it. It was from someone I'd met during my travels, someone who made me laugh and think in equal measure. Hey, Laura, how about dinner when you're back? No expectations, just food and good company. I stared at the message, a smile slowly spreading across my face. Maybe it was time to open my heart again, but on my terms, at my pace. I looked at the text and replied, 
Yes, hitting send before I could second-guess myself. Looking out at the city lights, I felt a sense of excitement for the future. I had moved on, not just from Eric and his family, but from the person I was when I was with them. I was stronger, wiser, and ready for whatever came next.